does race mean when we speak about race in the context of the Middle East and North Africa? Leslie, without any further ado, I'm gonna I'm gonna highlight I'm gonna I'm gonna highlight your 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 screen and uh, and hand the show over over to you. And thank you so much for being here with us this morning. Great, thank you um, for that introduction. I'm really delighted um, to be here. And yeah, again, as a parent of New Haven Public School kids, um, this just means a lot to me that teachers would give up their time um, just after the school, you know, the school year has stopped to, to be here and really explore these issues. And I'm excited about the ways they might make their way into the classroom. Um, so as Abdurrahman mentioned, I'm a postdoc in the Macmillan Center and my affiliations are both with the uh, Council of African Studies and with Middle East Studies. And the reason for that is that my research really spans both of these. So as you know, as, as you just heard, I'm interested in how border enforcement in North Africa affects West and Central African migrant people who are traveling up from their homes across the Sahara Desert and into countries like Morocco, and finally hoping to take the, the boat trip across the Mediterranean Sea to Europe. And so you can see here a, a map of some of the routes that people take from South to North. Um, I came to this topic because I lived in Morocco off and on since 2001, and over the course of you know 20 plus years, I've really witnessed how immigration has become more prominent in both government policy and in just people's everyday perceptions. So the buildup of border fences and surveillance technology, which has been funded mostly by Europe, um, and the framing of sub-Saharan African immigration as a crisis, despite actually really small numbers of people that we're talking about, has increased racism against Black people who are assumed to be illegal outsiders um, just because of their skin color. And so um, and this is just an example from Morocco. Um, on the left is a 2012 Newsweek leak like Time or Newsweek um, that you know, says the Black danger. And then the, the one on the right is um, shows the a cover um, right at the beginning of the coronavirus outbreak in in March. And it's suggesting that the first case of the virus was brought by a by a sub-Saharan migrant person. But in fact, it was not. It was brought by a non-Black Moroccan who had just traveled from Europe. Um, so yeah, so this like a uh, buildup of borders and anti-immigration sentiment affects not only undocumented West and Central African people, but tens of thousands of legal re residents, such as students, medical workers, and so on. And then finally, Black Moroccans are feeling these effects too, because people just assume they don't belong there, um, either asking them where they're from, right? Or saying maybe even racist things about them in Arabic, thinking that they don't understand the language. Um, but at the same time, this uh, anti-immigrant and anti-Black sentiment in the region has led to solidarities and protests by migrant organizers and human rights activists across the region, most famously kind of after CNN broke a story about um, the enslavement of people, of migrant people in Libya. And so I've been able to witness how this discrimination against Black people in Morocco leads to new solidarity movements and is really moving the needle on um, anti-racist organizing um, and challenging racist treatment of both immigrants and citizens across the country and also throughout North Africa. So that's like just kind of how I got into some of these questions. Um, so I want to build today on this idea of solidarity by presenting what I'm calling three entries into thinking about race or racism in the Muslim majority world. And each of these entries tells a story of Blackness in North Africa, but it also points to how other places like Europe, um, Southwest Asia, and the Americas are bound up in these stories as well. And we might think of these connections as a faculty member here at Yale, Lisa Lowe says, as continental intimacies. 
So the first intimacy I want to think about is um, a 17th century struggle over slavery that took place in Morocco, and it shifted the way that race was perceived and continues to be perceived um, in the country and across the region. And then second, I focused on a specific moment when African Americans and North Africans united together in the struggle against colonialism and white supremacy particularly at the 1969 Pan-African Festival in Algiers, Algeria. And then finally, I'll move us to the present to highlight some North Africans who are speaking openly about the problem of anti-Blackness in the region and calling for Afro-Arab or Afro-Berber solidarities that link anti-racist, anti-colonial, and anti-border struggles uh, more globally. And then just a quick note before I get into the kind of the meat of things, I want to unpack a couple of terms for us. So the first one is black or blackness. When I refer in this talk to black people, I am talking about people who are who um, self identify or are identified as black. And in North Africa, as in much of the Muslim majority world, blackness is not just about skin color, but also has to do with your family origin, descent from slavery, or even just cultural and linguistic characteristics. And whiteness actually operates very similarly in the region. So to someone from the US, you might look at two people and, and think both of them might be characterized as black. But because of their lineage and kin networks, one of them might um, be identified within their community as a black person and the other one might be identified within their community as a white person. Um, so that, you know, so kind of we need to keep that in our mind as we're going through this talk today. And then the second one quite very quickly is that I will be using the acronym SWANA, Southwest Asia and North Africa, rather than Middle East and North Africa, just to capture a more geographic, accurate geographical designation of the places and populations that I'm talking about, and one that seeks to decenter you know, European ideas of this exotic East, which is sort of where, where the idea of the Middle East came from. All right, so let's get into it. Um, before I talk about 17th century Morocco, I do need to give you a little bit of background on slavery in the Muslim world from the time of the birth of Islam in the 7th century in what is now called Saudi Arabia um, to the early modern period. So while there's evidence that prior to the 7th century, slavery was already practiced in the Arabian Peninsula and Africans in particular were already associated with the institution, with the spread of Islam, the nature of enslavement changed in, in some really important ways. So first, Islamic law forbids the enslavement of Muslims. And over time, people find, found some, some workarounds to this. Like, for example, um, if someone converted to Islam after already being enslaved, uh, that didn't necessarily change their slave status. But most religious scholars in the Muslim world uh, agreed that it was forbidden to enslave fellow Muslims. And then the second change that came about through the Islamic legal system was that slavery could no longer be inherited through the mother's line, which is, um, what was happening much later in the United States. Um, so what that meant is that for female slaves who were concubines of free masters, and concubinage was a really common practice uh, at the time, their children were automatically born free and they would take the name and lineage of their fathers. So some of these children went on to become rulers themselves if their fathers were, you know, if their fathers were rulers. And in addition, freeing slaves was considered a good deed under Islam and a way to demonstrate one's piety. So it was a practice um, that especially wealthy people would do where they would manumit or set their slaves free often after they'd kind of gotten old or outlived their usefulness, but as a way of, you know, a way of demonstrating their Muslim piety. Um, what did not change is that the most common way to get slaves was as captives in battle, and this continued to be a significant source of enslaved people for about a thousand years. All right, so um, in less than 150 years after the birth of Islam, the Islamic empire had spread over vast regions of North Africa, Central Asia, and Europe. And as more and more people converted to Islam, Sub-Saharan Africa became a major source of enslaved non-Muslim peoples. Uh, 
Um, there were still enslaved European, Turkic, Slavic, and other Asian peoples, but by the 13th century or so, the number of enslaved sub-Saharan Africans outnumbered these other groups in North Africa to the extent that the word slave in Arabic, which is abd, became another word for black or sub-Saharan African person. So those that, that language abd became a word for slave, but also just became a word for black person. So by the 16th century, however, many of the kingdoms of the South in Africa had also become Muslim. And so captives were enslaved by West African kingdoms and sold on to traders um, from the Sahara to transport further north to North Africa and Europe. And at the same time, the Portuguese began buying or capturing and forcibly transporting enslaved people across the Atlantic largely from West Africa, but also from Morocco's Atlantic coast. Mm -hmm. And I think probably the most famous of these Moroccan slaves who crossed the Middle Passage was Estebanico Azamori, who was first sold in Spain and then traveled with Panfilo de Naves to Florida, where um, they had like kind of a series of shipwrecks and he eventually walked something like 3000 miles to Texas at which time he was re-enslaved by indigenous people there, along with captives from other expeditions, including Cabeza de Vaca. So um, I just feature here Leila Lalami's excellent um, historical novel called The Moors Account, which tells the story from the standpoint of Esteban Nico and really calls into question this like age of conquest or age of exploration idea by telling it from the perspective of enslaved and indigenous people. Anyway, um, with the Portuguese and Spanish expanding into Morocco and Africa from the north, so pushing like from Europe into Morocco, and the Ottoman Empire expanding across North Africa from the east, by the late 17th century, Morocco was in a pretty vulnerable position. And it was at this point that Moulay Ismail, this guy here on the stamp, becomes Sultan or leader of Morocco. And his goal, his task is to try to unite the country that's kind of divided into sort of tribal and local units with their own militias. So he drew on this idea, he took this idea from the Ottomans and decided to form an army that didn't have any loyalties to these local networks by using black enslaved people or former slaves. So for a couple of years, he just called for volunteers from across Morocco among formerly enslaved people and ended up yielding an army of about 5,000 people. He was like offering everyone a horse and, you know, uniforms and weapons and that, that sort of stuff thing. But he didn't get as much as he wanted. So he sent his secretary to forcibly enslave and enlist any dark skinned black or a man or woman, regardless of their status as an enslaved or free person, and regardless of the fact that every single one of them were Muslims. So in this way, Moulay Ismail was able to muster an army that people estimate was between like 150 and 220,000 people. And it is at this moment when all Black people become automatically enslaved um, that uh, slavery in Morocco becomes a racial institution and cements this notion of blackness and enslavement as, you know, as synonymous in terms of status. So this action was not without some pushback. Um, in Fez, one of the, the really important cities in Morocco, the Har Haratin, which is a group of marginalized black and brown people, refused categorically to submit to the Sultan's order and, and went into hiding. And religious leaders, the ulema, also protested, including Abdesalam Jassus, who issued a religious ruling or fatwa against the sultan's idea, saying, as for those uh, who are today marked out for enslavement and who are our immediate concern, we grew up in the same town. We know them well. We know their free status and nothing pertaining to their condition is hidden from us. On the whole, the evils that are associated with this issue are innumerable. So for this statement, Jesus was um, imprisoned and tortured and his family's possessions were confiscated. And then after all of this, when he still refused to retract his protest, he was executed publicly by strangulation. 
And all over the country, other religious scholars and judges lost their jobs or resigned in protest or were exiled to the mountains. And eventually the remaining leaders um, kind of signed on the dotted line and expressed support for this scheme, um, enabling Mule Ismail to muster this massive army um, that became a really powerful force until the end of his reign. Okay, so now we're gonna fast forward uh, about three centuries and moved to the United States, which is in the midst of tremendous social foment. So in the late 1960s, we have the Civil Rights Act uh, of 1964 has already been passed, but black Americans continue to be the subject of police violence and societal racism. In 1968, Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. Protests were also breaking out all over the country against the Vietnam War, which was interpreted by many as an act of imperial aggression. Um, the Black Panther Party, founded in California in 1966 by Bobby Seals and Huey Newton, were among those who were giving speeches and putting the problems of racism in the United States within the context of these larger struggles against colonialism, against white supremacy, and against predatory capitalism. So a huge influence on the Panthers and on other anti-colonial activists all over the world was Franz Fanon, who is a Caribbean psychiatrist who did his residency at a hospital in French occupied Algeria, an experience that made him realize the extent of the violence of colonialism on the psyches of colonized people. So he eventually, during this residency in this French hospital in Algeria, um, he just couldn't take it anymore and eventually resigned from his position and joined the Algerian Freedom Fighters, the National Liberation Front. The French deported him soon after, and he ended up spending the rest of his life in neighboring Tunisia, organizing, writing, and practicing medicine and assisting the FLN, the National Liberation Front of Algeria. So for Fanon, the struggle against anti-Blackness and the struggle against colonialism were bound up in the same struggle against European and US domination and white supremacy, although he didn't actually use that last term. Um, Fanon's books became required reading for anti-colonial and anti-racist activists all over the world, including the Panthers, whose struggle always included not just a Black nationalist agenda, but also an anti-imperialist one, um, including opposition to the Vietnam War and U.S. and European imperialism in Southwest Asia, in Indonesia, and on the African continent. So by 1969, the Panthers are under tremendous pressure. Huey Newton, who is one of the co-founders of the BPP, was in prison in California. In May 1969, Panther Alex Rackley was murdered as an informant here in New Haven, um, which resulted in the arrest of the other BPP co-founder, Bobby Seals, who was in town in New Haven visiting. Um, FBI head J. Edgar Hoover declared that the Black Panther Party without question represents the greatest threat to internal security of the country. In the summer of 1969, Eldridge Cleaver, who was the Panther Ministry, uh, Minister of Information and a former presidential candidate, arrived in Algeria from Cuba, where he had fled the previous year to avoid arrest in the United States. So I'm going to show a, a scene from the film Judas and the Black Messiah that references this um, references this 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 occurrence. The Eldridge Cleaver has taken up residence in Algeria, and so what we're going to see here is that Fred Hampton's friends. It's getting toward the end of you know the pressure from the FBI is mounting, police violence and, and antagonism against the Panthers in Chicago is mounting. And so his friends are really trying to urge him to, to consider leaving the country. And I should note here that, um, that I was unable with my limited editing skills to edit out the language. So please forgive me in advance for some of the strong language. Wait a minute, is it? Like up checks, passports, driver's licenses, things of that nature. Yeah, but how far are we gonna get when one of us is 37 weeks pregnant? You could be in a van in less than 24 hours, and they have some of the best doctors in the world. Okay, let's just hope that's not the day that Nixon decides to nuke that motherfucker. Look, Algeria, they got Minister Eldridge, not to mention bungalows by the sea. 
the Cubans got ocean for days. You know how long it'll take to get to Algeria? The Cubans are hopping to skip away. There is a network of safe houses heading south. I could put a call in the central. Y'all spending all this time. Okay. Move on. All right, so why Algeria? Um, Amical Cabral, who is the leader of the Guinea-Bissau uh, Freedom Fighters, once famously said, the Muslims make pilgrimage to Mecca, the Christians to the Vatican, and the national liberation movements to Algiers. So in the 1960s, Algeria really was the capital of third world internationalist movements against colonialism across worldwide. From 1954 to 1962, Algeria had fought a bloody war with the French to win their independence. And the French were guilty of tremendous atrocities, including widespread torture and the execution of civilians, which was documented in the film, The Battle of Algiers, that was released in 1966 and had a tremendous impact, turning the tide globally against French, the French and French imperialism and exposing the violence of settler colonialism. So as a newly independent country, Algeria was a massive supporter of other anti-colonial struggles in Africa, providing weapons, advice, refuge for freedom fighters from other African countries and for struggles across the world. So when Eldridge Cleaver and his wife Kathleen and some other Panthers arrived in Algeria, they were welcomed and immediately invited to attend the Pan-African Cultural Festival um, in 1969. The Panthers were given storefront space on one of Algiers' main streets, and within months they were moved to a government-sponsored house where they were they set up the international quarters of the Black Panther Party. Um, Algeria gave them like not just the house but supplies. I think they maybe gave them a vehicle and uh, monthly salaries for the employees there. So delegates at the Pan African uh, 1969 Pan African Festival, delegates from liberation movements in Palestine, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, South Africa, Angola, and Congo Brazzaville held meetings, brainstorming sessions, and idea, idea sharing, and met with Algerian government officials, which had um, Algeria at that point in the government had a special office that was just set up for aiding international liberation movements. Um, Stokely Carmichael, who had just left the Panthers and was living in Guinea, along with his wife, Miriam Makeba, the, the famous South African singer and anti-apartheid activist, also attended this conference, and Makeba performed. Nina Simone, Maya Angelou, Richard Wright's daughter, Julia, and other artists and musicians from the U.S. and from the African-American diaspora were also in attendance. So the feeling of solidarity, um, you know, according to multiple accounts of this time, reached its peak on August 1st when jazz musician Archie Shep and Algerian Touaregs from the Sahara Desert played together, improvising while U.S. beat poet Ted Jones read the poem that begins, we have come back, jazz is a Black power, jazz is an African power, jazz is African music, we have returned. And so I'll end this entry with a short one more clip. This is the last clip of the, of the talk um, from that night where you'll see Archie Shep blowing a Tuareg horn and wearing traditional Tuareg clothing. And then behind him is a line of Tuareg men and women. And I think the clip just gives you a sense of like who the participants are in this conference and um, what the energy of that night was about and the excitement of these sorts of solidarities was all about. So let's see, here we go. Thank you. 
of California, we have returned. Okay. All right. Um, three. The uprisings against authoritarian governments across, across the Suwana region in 2011, and that those uprisings are, were termed by the media the Arab Spring, and activism and organizing among migrant people and human rights activists um, around the anti-immigrant and anti-Black violence that pervades North Africa created new awareness and space for marginalized racial, religious, and ethnic groups to speak about their experiences. Um, so yeah, I should have said, so we're moving to the present right now. Um, in addition to the reckoning that was taking place in the US, in addition, in addition, I'm sorry, the reckoning taking place in the US since 2014, murder of Michael Brown by police officer Darren Wilson in Ferguson, and especially since the June 2020 murder of George Floyd by Derek Chauvin, has emboldened Black North Africans and other African diasporas to speak publicly about racism that they encounter in daily life. And let me just say here and really underscore this, and some, some folks might have to trust me, but it's a this is a big deal because it's been taboo to talk about race, to talk about slavery, um, and to talk about the experience of vi you know, racial violence or discrimination in the region. And it's often framed as something that's American or something that's European and not something that's, that's um, you know, relevant to the North African experience. And in addition, North African countries do not officially count ethnic or racial groups in their censuses. So it's not even possible to know how many black people there are in the region. And even today, scholars, celebrities, government officials, and ordinary people, you know, just dismiss race and discussions about racism, which makes it much more challenging for folks who are trying to talk about their own experience to, to be really public and speaking about it. So for this last entry, I'm going to briefly tell you about three people who are speaking out anyway and approaching the issue of anti-Blackness and the legacies of slavery through different media um, but each are having a significant impact on keeping the conversation about racism front and center in North Africa. Okay, so this first person is Saada Mosfa, who founded the anti-racist organization Menimti and is a member of the Voices of Black Tunisian Women Collective that was founded by another Black uh, Tunisian activist, Maha Abdelhamid. So Ms. Mospa's family is from Gabez, which is a town with a significant black, uh, marginalized black population. And for years, her profession was a flight attendant where she said she encountered racism, you know, all the time, both within the region and then just as she traveled across the world. After 2011 and moves toward democratization in Tunisia, Ms. Muspa, along with several other members of her family, started doing anti-racist uh, organizing and, 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 and activism, pushing for recognition of the presence of Black Tunisians in the country and for the passage of an anti-discrimination law. So she actually succeeded um, along with other activists in Tunisia in this last aim in 2018, when Tunisia became the first Swana country to outlaw racial discrimination. And Algeria followed Tunisia's lead in 2020 and passed a similar law. Um, another, uh, another outcome of this is that in 2019, uh, a high court ruled that descendants of slaves can drop the word atig, for, which means freed by, from their name. Um, so they don't have to carry with them for generations the mark of enslavement and also the mark of um, liberation or manumission or emancipation as being something that was granted to them by their masters. Um, and so uh, Saada Mosba continues to be active today and has submitted a file with a truth, the Tunisian Truth and Reconciliation uh, Committee to try to get recognition about the wrongs historically done um, in, uh, in Tunisia against Black Tunisians. And um, yeah, and is, and is starting to connect with uh, Tunisian diasporas in North Africa to think about these sort of transcontinental um, anti-racist movements. So the second person is Mbarak 
uh, Washishi, who is a Black Moroccan born in a small Berber village uh, called Aka. And Berbers are, or Amazigh, are the indigenous people of Morocco and of much of North Africa. So Mbarak's work explores the invisibility of Black North Africans who often live in or also or come from invisible or forgotten places in rural areas or in the desert, far from the cities where power tends to be concentrated. And his work explores and questions these ideas of empty and full space, of visible and invisible through the lens of his own life experience. His art is a process of reclaiming this history of blackness in the region and telling a story of a Morocco that is black in his words and a North Africa that is black. In the past couple of years, his work has really gained traction within Morocco, where his pieces are exhibited in the National Museum and in prominent galleries, which is again, a really big deal because it's opening the door for a lot of these conversations about the presence of Black uh, North Africans and also the racism that they have encountered. And then Mbarak says that his that African American writing was really central for helping him find the language to speak about what it meant to be Black in Morocco and across North Africa. So he said, you know, and he didn't even have the words to 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 describe his experience and what it meant for him to experience racism in his daily life um, before encountering these writings. And this piece on the left, Back Up, is a recent collaboration with another artist, Sasha Huber, and is an installation that features fragments of poetry by Norbezi Phillips, who is a Canadian poet originally from Trinidad and Tobago. Zong is her book-length poem about a 1781 court case that involved the murder of 130 enslaved Africans by a British slaver who basically threw people overboard in order to make an insurance claim. The poem is fragmented and breaks apart the legal documents of the court case to untell history from the perspective of unfair laws and finance arrangements. And it rearranges the fragments to provide new possibilities while still being tied to the truth of what happened. And Philip says that Zong is supposed to be improvised each time, like jazz, like we saw in the previous um, Archie Shep uh, film to let its music, its truth, and its people be present to us, but in a spectral or ghostly form. The untelling of dominant stories and the telling of untold stories, both of these are really central to Philip's work in Zong, but they're also the guiding principle of Mbarak's work too, and why he chose to do this this particular piece by engaging in her poetry. And so you can see, you know, on the left, you can see the pieces have some of those fragments from her poetry there. Um, and you can go into the room and sit with it and just be present to that and listen to those sort of um, spectral tellings of the past. And then finally, we have Fatima Zahra Katubu. Um, the murder of George Floyd galvanized a new young, a generation of young activists in North Africa. Identifying as Afro-Arab or Afro-Berber, these activists, and again, many of them are women, just like in the United States movement, and also in the, in the kind of previous generation of activists that we see with uh, Saada Mospa. Um, but these young activists had turned to digital platforms to shed light on the experiences of Black people in North Africa today. So on Instagram, you have the Mazij Project, Kahwanus Nus, Black Arab Collective, Black Lives Matter Tunisia. And these are all platforms where most, mostly young, educated, Black identifying North Africans witness to the experience of being Black in the Swana region. Fatima Zahra Katubu, who founded the Instagram site Black Moroccans in 2020, is also from Aka, which is the same uh, village that Bushishi, Mbarak Bushishi is from, but grew up in Agadir, which is a mid-sized city on Morocco's southern Atlantic coast, and is also one of the Portuguese ports during the slave trade. She says that the goals of her site are to raise awareness about the problems of racism in Moroccan society and to bring the history of slavery to the public and to showcase the talents and accomplishments of Black Moroccans in order to fight stereotypes. 
A big feature of her platform, and this is what we're looking at right now, is testimony. Ordinary Moroccans, as well as more well-known people, tell stories of their encounters with anti-Black racism. So we have on the top right, um, the woman in the top right submitted a story. She videoed herself, or she took a picture of herself and submitted a story telling about her experience just growing up, experiencing anti-Blackness both in society at large and then sometimes even from her own family. And then the bottom right is the first black um, newscaster in Morocco. And then um, on the left is a designer from Casablanca who after 2020 really started to um, use his work to raise awareness about uh, blackness as an indigenous um, or a, you know, as something that's present in the region. And then this site, along with others, is also a clearinghouse for action, particularly as Instagram often is, I think, in the cultural dom domain. So, for example, last year, Caftans du Maroc, which is a well-known Moroccan fashion magazine, featured on the left this photo shoot in which we see a light-skinned woman surrounded by attendants that were supposed to, it's supposed to evoke slavery, their enslaved attendants. And the outcry from Katubu and other digital activists was so vociferous that the images were taken down like in less than an hour. And in another case, a few months ago, a celebrity couple's uh, in Morocco's wedding featured black attendants again, fulfilling the role that slaves would have traditionally filmed. Um, you see someone holding an umbrella for the for the what this this looks like is holding the umbrella for the slave owners, and this provoked a massive com uh, conversation in the media, which actually implicated the king and the royal family who still have black attendants that perform these sorts of tasks. And it brought, um, you know, brought home the reality of the pervasiveness of slavery in Moroccan culture and in the Moroccan imaginary. So across the Swana region, and this includes the, you know, includes there are activists in Yemen and Palestine and Syria and Jordan all over. Digital activists have protested the widespread spread use of blackface in entertainment. And possibly for the first time, the practice is being banned on certain networks. Um, in addition, anti-discrimination laws that failed to pass in some countries a few years ago are again being reconsidered in parliamentary discussions. So this vibrancy and this visibility that's happening online is having effects in sort of you know, maybe I'm dating myself generationally, but what I would call the real world in ways that are really exciting and heartening. So just in brief conclusion, you know, the focus of the Summer Institute was on the important contributions and life experiences of Muslim and Swana people in the United States. But these influences don't just move in one direction, and that's what I'm hoping to show. Instead, that people in the US and people in the Swana region have been engaged in anti-racist and liberatory movements of all kinds. And these intimacies and solidarities of people in the distant and recent past, I think, are laying a foundation for today's struggle to a more liberatory future. And that's all I have. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm going to try thank to share. Thank you so much, Leslie. I'll, I'll, I'll wait for just a moment for you to drop the share screen. That was, that was absolutely stunning and fascinating. I have a whole page of questions, <laughs> which, which I know we can talk about for the next few days. Um, please, uh, please drop questions, comments, affirmations, concerns, interrogations into the chat or raise your hand and we'll, 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 we'll come to you. Would love to hear your feedback on, on Leslie's presentation. Um, I have to uh, do a quick program note, Leslie, before we jump into the meat, meat and potatoes, so to speak, of what you've talked about, which is my apologies for any confusion with the, with the Zoom link this morning. Um, I ha have offered another Zoom link to all the attendees, but they are linked to a particular attendee's name. So I apologize in advance to Michelle Norwood, who has been a very good sport about this, as your name continues to appear in the participant list, but it's actually a whole number of other participants who are trying to get this, all of this resolved and solved in time for, for this afternoon or at least tomorrow's session. 
all to say is that the link that I said you will most certainly work, just as you come into the room, please change your name to your real name, just so we know who you are and we can identify you and uh, we can we can benefit from your um, from your submissions. Uh, Leslie, why don't I start it off and then and then um, we'll jump into broader conversation. It was so interesting for me that you started off by giving us this incredible historical perspective. And I think that historical perspective in so many ways is, is vital because the relationship between what became Islamic civilizations, Islamic governances, Islamic polities, and slavery and race often get really confusing and confused. And I thought the way that you laid it out was really fascinating. And in fact, it complicated it for us even further, didn't it? In so many, in so many ways. I guess the question that comes to me, especially in light of what you spoke about towards the end of your presentation, is that how much do you feel within Morocco specifically, but within the broader um, a kind of a field of Middle East and North Africa, is there kind of a reckoning with the history part of it and with the theology part of it? And is there a kind of an active conversation around sort of how do we look at this history and this theology, this, these cultures around slavery and race differently from our, from our vantage point today? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think there's a couple answers to that, but yeah, I think there's a couple answers to that. I feel like sometimes I read, um, I read an article recently where someone talked about sort of uh, the debates around race and slavery in the region often get embroiled in like kind of academic discussions that then just take take away its force, right? Or you just get lost in the weeds and then you never, you know, and then you never get to it. And I think people are starting to um, maybe find their way out of those, <laughs> out of those weeds a little bit and say, look, slavery was different in all different places. It's not exactly the same across time and space. Race is different. Um, but there's also resonances, right? There's also, um, and there's also, again, these intimacies, these connections against uh, around the world um, that made that make it really important. And the folks that I think are talking about this, apart from digital activists who are actually doing a lot of sort of history instruction, sometimes I'm like, mm, where'd you get that source from? But, uh, but they are posting a lot of like ar archival documents that they find on the web that document this history of slavery um, or just other information that they find or even posting like academics articles like for folks to read popularly. But there's also a whole generation of North African and Middle Eastern uh, scholars, young, like this new generation of scholars who are starting to write on these things. And in the United States, we have a lot of um, sort of SWANA diasporas who are coming and doing this research here in the United States with some uh, scholars of slavery like Eve Trout Powell and, um, you know, and some other folks around the country. So I think in the next like five years, there's going to be a real shift in the academic work, in the historical work that's been done to really make this, this history more visible. Um, but I also think just like the Tunisia case really points to um, how much the reality of slavery is present within everyday culture if you just look for it from people's names having some marker that shows they were a slave or again the idea that the word for slave also means black you know those sorts of things if someone doesn't point them out to you you don't notice it right but now i think it has been pointed out and people are noticing it and so i think there's a new reckoning that's happening um across the region on these issues. And there's also pushback, right? Just like we have in the US around critical race theory and Europe has a lot of pushback about this too. I think there's the pushback, but the pushback only exists because I think there's a new awareness and a new public conversation that's happening. Has there been any engagement in this by religious scholars? Because, because obviously it's, the whole history of the way in which um, enslavement figured was, in many ways, you know, a uh, a question of of law, right? And and not only custom, but but also of law, and what eventually became sort of um, the great pantheon 
confusing and complicated as it is over thousands of years of, of, of Islamic sacred law. And so I do wonder that if in this moment, is there a kind of a reckoning with the law itself in the same way as that, you know, I teach at the Yale Divinity School and we speak to our students about the emergence of, 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 of you know, black theology. And we look at the emergence of a feminist uh, or womanist or within the Muslim context, Muslim theology. And we look at the emergence of queer theology. I, I wonder if there are similar sort of movements uh, uh, afoot, Leslie. Yeah, so I, I, I have no idea, except to say I would be stunned if there were not. I think it's too, I think at this point it's too unavoidable. And I think these are questions that um, both, you know, religious scholars and religious leaders are having to answer. Like these are questions that, that we all have, like regardless of our religious tradition, right? And so um, I think that it's pushing, I think the open conversation again is pushing, um, pushing leaders, pushing scholars to have to really reevaluate or to dig in and look at and think through the implications of this moment and how it relates to theology. So yeah, so I'm sorry, I can't answer um, with any measure of expertise, but again, I would be quite surprised. And I do know, I will say in Morocco, I have a dear friend, um, Reverend uh, Karen Thomas Smith, who does, um, who works, uh, does ecumenical conversations with um, pastors, like Christian pastors and priests in Morocco and um, Jewish rabbis and leaders, and then also Muslim um, imams. And they're having some of these conversations, again, particularly in the, in the context of um, migration, but they're all kind of working on and thinking through how these issues inform their faith and inform the teaching that they, that they bring to their, their congregants. Oh, I'd love to. I'd love to connect with that. With that. With that. See, Leslie, um, uh, uh, my dear friend Gabrielle has a has a has a, a, a love the talk and and offers this question to you. What were the debates between indigenous and black people in North Africa around that first racial discrimination bill in Tunisia in 2018? What coalitions pushed this forward, and was the bill they got different from what they wanted? What lessons do you see this offering us for future conversations on race? A really fascinating deep dive into this very pivotal moment that you that you spoke about. That's a great question. And, you know, I think that's like two or three dissertations <laughs> um, to answer. But I think one of the ways that might just give us a little bit more context is that a lot of these Okay, first, indigenous is a tricky word in North Africa. It's a complicated word. And so, um, but so is tribe. So are, you know, so are all the other words. But something that's really interesting about, let's, about Berber or Amazir societies, particularly in the like Saharan, you know, Southern North African region where a lot of them are and where, um, where some of the folks that I featured are from, is that a lot of those societies have this, scholars describe it as a client patron relationship. So you have um, an and, and anthropologist, European anthropologists, American anthropologists have complicated this too because of the sorts of um, ways that they have classified people. And so they will identify folks as Berber and then um, black, what I would call black Berbers as Berber speakers. And, and there's been this, this production both in North Africa in locally, and then also from anthropologists and scholars coming from the outside to make it look like the true Berbers are white, right? Or white, I mean, white has a certain meaning, but white. And then the black Berber speakers are not actually truly part of the community, but rather are the descendants of those people's slaves. And so there's been... There's been a um, patronage relationship where um, the Black Haratin is what they're called, and, and not all of them are called that, but Haratin community are sharecroppers often in the oases, uh, you know, the, the oases regions for the white the white Berber community. So, so it's a complicated situation, and there's a lot of tension there about um, there might be a like a bigger tribal sort of affiliation, but there still is a distinction between white and black that has a, a social status bound up in it. So it was quite a big deal to get that um, 
to get that 2018 law passed. And I suspect, and this is going to be me being a little bit cynical here, but I suspect that it was passed in the big city, right? Um, by people who aren't embroiled in these day-to-day politics of the Saharan and Oasis communities where you see a lot of this um, division or segregation happening. Does that sort of make sense? It's kind of a complicated situation. No, that, that does make sense. I, I, I want to I want to push de- uh, slightly deeper before we get to your question, Sylvia, which is also a really, really interesting question around this idea of of the coalition building, um, because I think that there's an interesting point there. Like you, as you're speaking about these divisions within Tunisian society, Berber, Amazigh, white Amazigh, black Amazigh, this contested idea of what indigenous means, and, you, and you're so right, isn't it? We take these terminologies from frames of reference that we have, like even the use of the term indigenous, for example, the place I'm originally from, Canada, has been very different, for example, than here in the United States, where I'm, where my ears are still slightly pricked when I hear the term American Indian, which in Canada, the the, the, the idea of somebody referred to as, it, it was indigenous, being referred to as Indian was, is, a, is a sort of now a a public anathema, you know, and so, so I think, I think this question about like who's coming together around this, and then I guess that's that last part of, of Gabriel's question is that I mean, if you look into your crystal ball because you're enmeshed as a researcher in the region, what it does this mean something for those broader conversations? Is it part of the, uh, the political cultural mood music, so to speak, that is that is driving. Uh, perhaps other institutional or cultural changes. Yeah, I think one thing I think is so. I think a lot of the solidarities, specifically around blackness, have been transnational. Um, and you know, there's a really interesting um, anthropologist named Marta Scaglioni who does research in one of these places in Tunisia, and she talks about how these rural people, their just lives and concerns are so different from you know black folks in the cities, right? And so there isn't quite as much feeling of solidarity, you know, as you might expect internally. But a lot of times, people are looking. Um, looking outside of the country or looking in the region for these, you know, for these horizontal solidarities. But I think a lot of that is because uh, this stuff is new um, since 2011. There's just starting to be a lot more, I mean, Amazia or Berber people just really started pushing for recognition in the 1980s and 1990s and were brutally in some cases, pushed back on those issues. And so this is all new, this idea of like thinking about recognition, thinking about identity, thinking about these sort of coalitions around um, equality and non-discrimination are new. And I think as more and more people get footholds into this, I think there will be more opportunities for, you know, for broader coalitions across, yeah, across internally and across the region. Oh, you're Sorry, muted. I'm, I'm going to go to Sylvia's question um, uh, on the history theology divide with regard to the narrative that you presented, Leslie, about Moulay Ismail. Clearly, the Sultan knew that enslaving Muslims would, was, quote unquote, wrong theologically. You suggested Black people were being enslaved under Moulay Ismail on the color basis of race. What was the territorial range of the Moroccan Empire or state at this time? Uh, Sylvia is wondering if the rise in Black enslavement was due to the uh, competition and impact of the transatlantic slave trade. Would you be able to comment on that? Um, and then, uh, and then Sylvia does make a follow-up remark uh, asking uh, that, is it right to assume that, that Black slaves in the service of the Sultan could and did uh, convert to, to Islam? Fascinating question. Um, yeah, thank you for that, Sylvia. Uh... Okay, so first, so interestingly, you said clearly the Sultan knew that enslaving Muslims was wrong theologically. Yeah, I think so. But he refused to ever talk about religion, like Muslim, ever to refer to them as Muslims, ever. Like kind of skirting the issue, just he just never mentioned it. And he actually invoked the language of, oh, by the way, quickly shout out. Um, I'm drawing a lot of this research from Shuki El Hamel and his 2013 book, Black Morocco. And I, I do have... I started a list of resources, but I'm still working on it. But anyway, that's where a lot of this is coming from. But he used the language of fugitivity and was like, well, they were fugitives or maybe their grandparents were fugitives. And so, you know, once a slave, always a slave, which again was just really a different perspective altogether 
um, you know, from from what had existed before. And there were a few other folks who tried to do that um, previously, but Mule Ismail was so it was so visible and um, and obvious and kind of lasting in terms of the effect that it had. Um, let's see. And, and then I actually don't think, so I'm skipping the territorial range um, for now, but I actually don't think that the enslavement of Black people for Mule Ismail's army um, was an increase in, um, in enslavement, but rather uh, it maybe shows the ways in which some of those trans-Saharan networks weren't providing enough, right? So you had to enslave people, you couldn't get enough people transported across the Sahara to fulfill demand. And so, which could be partly because of the Trans-Saharan, you know, just complete obliteration of communities in West Africa. Um, but so instead he looked locally, he looked internally to find these, these outsiders um, who could constitute this army that would be loyal only to him. Um, I should say there were moments around the time of the Trans-Saharan slave trade where, where there were bumps like for example in Egypt in 1860s the cotton boom because the civil the this is another intimacy continental intimacy so the U.S. Civil War happened suddenly you don't have as many people working on plantations producing cotton and Egypt gets into the cotton game in a big way and so then suddenly they need to find slaves they need to find workers fast and so they turn to the Sudan um, and enslave a bunch of folks uh, for a few years to um, to, pro to produce cotton, and then the the bottom drops out of the cotton market internationally, and that's the end of that. So, so slavery in in North Africa, you know, kind of went up and down with the vagaries of things that were happening sometimes really far away, but it continued to because it lasted for a thousand or more years. It was the numbers by the end of it were quite high, but it was never year by year at the intensity that the trans transatlantic slave trade was. Wow, it, it, it's, there's so many issues that that brings up, Leslie, and I and I can't help but but think about like like as as you yourself have pointed out, particularly with those almost shocking images of contemporary Moroccan cultural outputs that are showing subservience and power dynamics in such a stark, almost I mean, you know, I guess maybe maybe not tone deaf within that cultural environment, maybe so uh, a racism that's so endemic that, that folks don't see it. But I think to our eyes, that stuff, that it, it, it just looks astonishing, you know? And, and, I'd, and I'd like to get into that in just, uh, just a moment. But Zaire uh, uh, Bazawi has a really interesting, um, has a really interesting observation. Uh, many of the laws are inherited from French colonialism in North Africa. The, the Code de l'Indigent, which is a set of laws and regulations characterized by arbitrariness, which created in practice an inferior legal status of natives of French colonies uh, during the second half of the 19th century, is somehow equivalent to the Code Noir, the Black Code of uh, Louis XIV and 7th century France. And as you just said, Leslie, we can still see many aspects of these practices in the simple daily life of North Africans. In 2018, for instance, Miss Algeria, who was of dark skin, was bullied on the internet uh, and throughout the country uh, because beauty is still associated with whiteness. Anyways, all of this to say that there's a big need for teaching post-colonial studies and critical race theory in North Africa through an, through an intersectional approach. Which brings him to this question. Thank you, Zaire, for, for that preamble. Really interesting. Um, and I'd love to unpack it a little bit. I don't know if you are aware of the education system in North Africa, Leslie, but I was wondering if you would think that decolonizing the curriculum and education would start happening or at least be uh, debated. That's a really interesting question for you because I know you've taught in, in, in Morocco. You were a, you were a professor at Al Ahouane University and and I think you, you'll have some really interesting insight on this. Yeah, that's a great, a wonderful question. And I encourage everyone just to read Zaire's like history because it's really good kind of context too. Um, yeah, I mean, amen to needing post-colonial and critical race theory in North Africa. I think it's a hot potato, especially right now because of, because Morocco is still, you know, it orients sometimes toward France, right? And the, this debate about critical race theory in France and decolonial theory is huge. Um, 
either last year or the year before, like hundreds of intellectuals and professors took out an ad in, I don't know if it was in Le Monde, it seems like it'd be a Figaro kind of place. But anyway, they took an ad out in the newspaper and basically said like, we have to purge our education system of, um, you know, we have to purge our education system of these Americanist divisive theories like critical race theory and post-colonial theory because France is for French and it's united and ethnicity and race don't matter and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so, you know, Morocco is interesting because the Moroccans within France are being targeted with that erasure, like France for French people kind of always produces or assumes that North Africans um, North African French people are outsiders, right? So they are vulnerable. But there's also this exchange, you know, of academic ideas um, that could make Moroccans more, um, you know, more leery of that. And then within Morocco itself, Morocco, when you drive, when you go to any town, almost any town in Morocco, there's somewhere on the landscape, you know how in the US we have the Hollywood sign, like on the on the mountain. Um, so as you drive into many towns, you see this these three words in Arabic, Allah, al watan al malik which means um, God, country, and king. And it's about a, a unified people under this, this banner. And there's not a lot of space for difference, right? And um, there's been openings regarding Amazir people, but you know, there's still a lot to be done. So so that was kind of a that was a long winding answer to say I'm just not sure about the spaces for that. I do know there are individual academics who are really pushing through and thinking about these things. And I think the condition of North Africans in France and in Belgium and in other places in Europe and the experiences of anti-Islam, anti-Muslim sentiment and racism against North Africans might be the space where people in North Africa are attuned to the need for a post-colonial or decolonial curriculum. And so I think that might be the connection that makes that happen. Isn't that fascinating? I mean, we've often talked about, you know, in, in academic circles, but but also in, in, in circles of education, right? The, about the intersectionality between anti-Black racism, Islamophobia, even anti-Semitism and other forms of sort of institutionalized or systematized marginalizations um, and, and in many cases, demonizations of people. It's it's so interesting that that connection between racialization and Islamophobia becomes almost like this kind of pregnant space, like you said, for the questions about race to intersect in the Maghreb, while in 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 Europe the questions around race are intersecting with 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 religion. So they almost seem like two sides of the same sort of a discursive coin, isn't it? Totally. Absolutely. I think that that is, I think that is the, it is the space for political change right now, I think is that sort of that sort of connection in experiences and understanding it through that lens. You know, uh, as, as Zaire's comment um, around sort of the legacy of, of, of European ideas around race, and the ways in which those filtered into the legal and institutional codes and systems of places that were colonized is really interesting. It reminds me of the ways, for example, in British India, where certain religious denominations or certain typologies of people, Dalits, for instance, were it was instant that certain racism and certain marginalization was institutionalized in the laws, which of course hadn't existed before the East India Company and later the British Raj established itself. Um, and I think, and I think this question is really interesting is that, you know, the place that we're at today, at one point, at one level, your presentation makes us realize, oh, this is the result of really complex religio political historic narratives, right? That are, that are, that, that are literally thousands of years old and we're seeing the way that those percolate. But at the same time, it's their in intersection and engagement with colonization, which highlight them in a, in, in a certain way. And I, I just feel like that there's something really important there, right? In terms, of, in terms of understanding what race means now in relation to the colonial experience. Yeah, 
Absolutely. I mean, that's, yeah, I, you know, a lot of scholars of, um, of a lot of black studies scholars and a lot of scholars of race sort of uh, transnationally think about race as a modern construct, right? And then it was really born in the colonial, like colonial experience and the expansion of empire um, around the world. And I think, you know, I'm, um, what, do, what do I say? I'm heterodox on this in the sense um, that I think that there were indigenous or local ideas about race and about what it meant to be black or white or Arab or Amazir or Jewish, um, which we haven't talked about. Um, you know, in the region, but those did interface with these colonial ideas and the, the colonize, you know, the French in the French Maghreb, the French, French North Africa, they really codified people, they categorized and identified people. And the French basically said blackness isn't a North African thing. So they based, they erased blackness from the map in North Africa totally. And they divided cartographically and in terms of their studies and their the way that they wrote policy, they divided their colonial holdings into white Africa and black Africa. And um, you know, created this really, really rigid division that that I still hear that being used today, right? So if you're a North African with dark skin and you're in North Africa. Do you exist? Do you belong? Are you always an outsider, even if you're indigenous, right? And so that this like colonial construct about certain people belong in certain places, and there's no deviation from that persists to today. And then the other part of it that the French contributed to is this idea that that Black Africans are not real Muslims. And the French also did that with the Amazir people too, because they were trying to create a wedge, right, between these different groups so that they they wouldn't have as much resistance. Um, and so again, we see that there was something I was just looking at a, a couple of days ago that was sort of assuming that Muslims from West Africa weren't like really Muslims or weren't, you know, true Muslims or it's just folk and so it doesn't count. And a lot of these ideas were really perpetuated by the colonial powers to divide and rule. Um, and we see a lot of that fallout even today. Wow, that, that, I mean, it, it, right away, your comments have raised two questions, which I'm just gonna put on the table, even if we can't fully address them right now. Um, uh, Sylvia uh, uh, comes in on this and says, isn't the very geographical term North African as opposed to Sub-Saharan or Black African itself a racial divide? And doesn't that colonial persist, particularly in Morocco with Spanish enclaves of Sueta and Melilla? Thank you for mentioning those um, Sylvia, especially as those have been really the sites of the front lines of the refugee crisis and a lot of violence against people fleeing um, incredible themselves, fleeing violence and poverty in, in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, huge refugee immigration issue there today because of Suet and Malila are still part of the, the EU. And then Gabrielle comes in and, and, and asks also a really interesting question, what material interest did the French have in erasing blackness from North Africa? How did the decision of division aid the French colonial project. And maybe let's spend a minute on that. And then I want to finish up with with a with an with a with a with an education curriculum strategy question for you, uh, Leslie. Okay. Um, very quickly, yes. So sub-Saharan, I actually spend a lot of time trying not to say that. <laughs> I say for so for when I'm just talking about Morocco, I talk about West and Central Africans um, because those are the folks that usually are I encounter in Morocco. But it's difficult when you're talking about all of North Africa, because there's East Africans, there's Central, and then it's a struggle. But I think you're right. Like it shows this cartographic division that has become um, just so fixed in our language that it's hard to get around, right? And it's something we need to think about really seriously. Um, and yes, I, you're right. Like the colonial presence does persist in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, in, in, in part, I mean, I don't want to overstate it because I also want to maintain Moroccan agency, right? I don't want to say Moroccans are powerless, but the EU has really driven this border enforcement and buildup of the border against West and Central African refugees and migrants coming to Morocco. And, you know, Morocco doesn't, have a stake in whether or not they go on to Europe, right? It's not Morocco's like 
concern. So it is driven by sort of a like a, a European program that then is impacting Morocco, um, both materially and spatial and socially in a lot of different ways. And then Gabrielle, um, so I should not even answer that question um, <laughs> because I don't know for sure, except I would point you to like oil and some development in the Sahara and some of the French projects related to that. And there's some researchers that have done work on how the French pacified the Saharan regions of North Africa much later and um, and tried to create and they had a different like uh, colonial regime there and they they had to create all kinds of new categories of people to make sense of of the folks that are sort of between what they just defined as North Africa and West and Central Africa. But I think there's a lot of really good research done on that. I just am not the one who has done it. <laughs> Leslie, with the, with the eight minutes that we have we have left, and, and I really appreciate these these questions coming up and you addressing them. And I think Sylvia's question around the refugee, what has been termed the refugee crisis, but has been the really the refugee experience for many decades of people coming from underdevelopment um, and neo-colonization, all of the difficult sort of remnants of the colonial experience that have resulted in, in this kind of uh, some really catastrophic political and economic situations and people fleeing that for safety and, and, and coming up through North Africa and then us receiving stories in particular, I, I remember I was, I was in touch about a year and a half, two years ago with folks who were working in Libya around basically neo-slavery happening as, as folks were coming up from places like Chad and Niger into Libya, they were literally being enslaved and being held in, in slavery and denture until such point as they could get on rickety boats and take their chances across the, across the Mediterranean. And many thousands of people have been essentially, I think, murdered uh, by, by smugglers and, and, and others who have, who have, who have uh, you know, offered them the dream of a, of a journey across the Mediterranean to, to, to Italy in particular. Um, I think all that like it, it feels very heavy, right? In this particular political moment and often has been forgotten, you know, not to say that the Syrian refugee crisis wasn't itself catastrophic, indeed it was, but it was precursored by an equally catastrophic um, mm -hmm. a crisis across the Mediterranean. And I think even the way that that has been treated by media, by our public discourse is indicative of, of the racism that, that, that exists within our reporting of these things. Here's my question for you, Leslie. Um, as educators are looking for ways to expand students' awareness and knowledge about not just the American struggle, but as you've said, the connection between the American struggle and the global struggle against anti-Black racism and broadly against, against political, political oppression, and being a mother of two students who are who are in the public school system in the amazing city of, 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 of New Haven, from your vantage point, both as a scholar and as a very active parent within the public school system, what are ways that you can see some of what you've sort of offered us today perhaps went itself into, into classrooms? Is it through literature? Is it through film? Are there specific things that, that, that you would like to kind of put into the mix and say, hey, these are ways in which we can begin to tell these broader stories of, of not, just, uh, not just of the experience of anti-Black racism, but actually these incredible stories of people, individuals, personalities, and movements that are uh, fighting uh, for that uh, that 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 other world where 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 this is this is pushed back. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I mean, I think one of the reasons I I organize this talk like in these three moments is to give like to give it multiple entries. Like, not that you would do all of it, but you know, there is a history. Like when we talk about. Um, you know, uh, when we talk about um, like the audit, you know, I'm thinking about my social studies classes, right? And we talk about the Ottoman Empire, we talk about um, de decolonization or something like that, that there are these, um, you know, these resonances, there are things that are happening on the ground um, with slavery, like slavery wasn't just an Atlantic novel, uh, novel or, you know, uh, only in the Atlantic or there, um, 
I mean, that's the Ottoman thing. Uh, decolonization was happening at the same time as the civil rights movement. Well, like, why is that? What's happening? What sorts of language is being um, used around these things? Were there, were people talking to each other? You know, so there's, there's ways to just kind of be thinking. Um, I think, I think it's really important to think relationally or transnationally. So when something's happening in one space, is, is it reverberating? to another space or is there something that's informing it, you know? And so for the history, I just tried to show some of those reverberations or those little spaces um, where we see that happening. And then, um, but definitely like Lalami's book, if if y'all haven't read it, like 10 out of 10 recommend. And when you're doing the age of exploration, like read some of that, you don't have to read all, but it's it's a powerful book that really, I think also her, it won the Pulitzer Prize. Her descriptions really give you a sense of what, um, you know, North America looked like um, prior to European settlement and what it was like to move through those spaces and inter interact with folks. Um, yeah, so some of uh, so some of those examples, and then I do think when we talk about 1969 or the 60s, I remember I was so excited in high school when we finally got to, the, to that period, like the last week of school or whatever in U.S. history. Um, but what's happening in the U.S. isn't happening in a vacuum, and so there. Are, and not only that, people are talking to each other across these spaces. Black poets were in touch with folks all over the world, right? Um, Anti-Vietnam activists were working within an anti-imperialist worldwide movement. And so being able to look for some of those connections and I can put a lot of resources, I can put a lot of resources together and, and hand them out, I think is the best way to just get students um, interested in, I don't know, I, for me, like, my, my emphasis is always um, on connection, right? Like where are the connections? Where are resonances? How are we, the, how is our human experience bound up in someone else's human experience? And I think that's what brings us to a more affirmative future. And so finding ways to sort of open up history, open up literature and see the connections that, that, that these things are situated and I think is a really powerful way to do it. And then for me, art has become a new, language for understanding things I didn't understand before. And so looking at Mbarak Bushishi's work and really thinking about what he's done and reading interviews by him, has helped me understand things that I didn't, I didn't necessarily recognize before. And I should say really quickly, um, you know, I moved to New Haven in 2009. I grew up in Texas. We're famous for our limited um, the limited ways that we tell U.S. history stories. Um, and I didn't know any, I didn't know anything about the Black Panthers in New Haven. I didn't know anything about these movements. And so it's just been really fascinating too, to just to get out in my own city and find and discover history like out here. And some of that history I found through, through local historians, through activists, but also in museums. I found it in music festivals, slam poetry and things like that too. Leslie, thank you, thank you so much. And, and one of the things that I that I, I, I want to let uh, those of us who are in the Zoom room today, and those of us who will be listening to the recording afterwards, is that one of the things, Leslie, that that we're imagining for the fall is to, is to think about ways in which we can bring some of these incredible artists, activists, um, change makers who are from Black, Indigenous, Berber, Amazigh backgrounds, those who have been pushing for social change on the ground. Uh, hopefully into a space uh, virtually where we can hear their stories. And also, I think, interrogate and investigate some of these really meaningful questions with them. So watch this space, everyone. We're really hoping to, to convene something that'll be, I, I, I hope will be really powerful, but also something that that will continue to, to be kind of an educational resource for all of us so that we have personalities and people to go back to. And also, um, like you said, novels, art, uh, cultural artifacts, cultural productions that we can sort of bring into our classrooms. I know I'm going to get ten emails right after the session, uh, Leslie, saying, uh, "Where is the where where is the recommended?" So so no pressure, but <laughs> but whenever you get a chance, please do please do get them to us. Um, I want to I want to thank you so much, Leslie, for taking for taking time out of the beginning of the of of of, of your summer 
to spend uh, to spend with us for designing this incredible presentation. Uh, we'll be uploading the slides uh, to the Google Drive, hopefully by this afternoon, if that's okay with you, uh, Leslie, and and so so you guys can refer back to them. Um, we reconvene in one hour with Dr. Sarah Seacats, and she is going to be leading us into this remarkable story about the Orientalist fantasies that emerged in Coachella Valley, California, around the coming of the date palms. We're going to hear about date palms, U.S. agriculture and empire. We're going to hear about the famous Haji Ali or Hai Jolly uh, from the uh, U.S. Army's Camel Corps. It's going to be a remarkable presentation. So please join us. In, in, in one hour. Till then, thank you, Leslie, and thank you to everyone uh, who was here, and we look forward to welcoming you, you back in 60 minutes. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. Leslie. Thanks, everyone. Take care. <laughs>